Building a software application today requires so many architectural decisions. Which programming language should you use? Which cloud service provider? Which database? A newer type of decision to make is which analytics platform to use. There are so many of these analytics platforms, and they vary based on cost and reliability and usability, but one thing that's constant is that most companies need something that does the things that an analytics platform does. You want to collect user events, whether that's an event on a smartphone or a web application or a continuous delivery system or anything. It could be from a device, from an Internet of Things application, and you want to collect those events and aggregate data based on it and perform analytics based on it. And there are service providers that can help you do this. One of these analytics platforms is Keen.io, and Dan Kador is a co-founder of Keen.io, and he joins us today to discuss the rise of these analytics platforms. Keen's architecture is built on Storm, Cassandra, and Kafka, and Keen uses these different distributed systems building blocks to create a scalable, reliable analytics backend. On today's episode, we explore the usage of analytics and the architecture of Keen's backend system, from data ingestion to processing to actually sending feedback to the user's application. We also discuss the business model of the analytics as a service company. And I want to take a moment to thank you for listening to the show. I really appreciate your listenership. And if you enjoy the show, please tell your friends, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter. Because that translates directly to growth and revenues for the show, to be frank. And as the revenues grow, we plan to reinvest money into Software Engineering Daily. Uh, this is what I do full-time, it's what I enjoy, and uh, I want to reinvest into it. So you can help keep the flywheel spinning if you enjoy the show by sharing with your friends and helping us grow. It really does translate to money and growth for us. So thank you for listening. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy this episode. I had a crazy idea a couple weeks ago. It's a photo sharing app that only has pictures of cats. When I finish my photo sharing cat application, I will be deploying it to Linode because Linode is the fastest hosted Linux provider. I don't want to get locked into a proprietary platform that's going to overcharge me as soon as my app gets popular. I just want a fast Linux server with simple pricing. Go to linode.com slash se daily and get $20 in free credit today. Plans start at $10 a month. So my free $20 will be plenty to launch my cat photo sharing app. Once I need to scale, I can use tools like node balancers and backups. And Linode has built-in dashboarding and metrics so that I can see the traffic to my Linode servers. And I can understand how many of my users are posting cat pictures and looking at each other's cat pictures. Go to linode.com slash se daily and get $20 in free credit today. The plans start at $10 a month, so it's a great deal. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Now let's get on to this episode. Keen.io is an analytics as a service platform. Dan Kador is the co-founder of Keen.io. Dan, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks. Awesome to be here. So every application has events that need to be logged and aggregated and analyzed. And I feel like in the past, maybe up until 2004 or 2005, companies could manage all of this event data themselves without too much trouble. Did something change in the world of applications that made it so that we are creating more events? Or, uh, or did these events somehow get harder to manage? What created the ecosystem where we needed an event uh, storage and aggregation service? Yeah, great question. I think the biggest change that happened around that time is not that, um, you know, not that, that there was something fundamentally different about the kind of data. It was instead that there was finally the knowledge that actually this data is really valuable. And it's starting to feel like maybe there's, we have the technology to capture it all. And once it's captured, then do something useful with it. So I'd say it was more of a sort of a, a, a mindset shift amongst uh, engineering and product teams. 
And certainly the volume of events has also increased dramatically. Yeah, I'd say with that mindset change came the came the belief that actually we can record a lot more than just our basic page views. Mm. And you know, as applications have become more complex and as applications have moved off the web and into into mobile and more native platforms, that's um, we see you know it's one of the reasons our customers appreciate us is because they can record any type of event. So, and as we talk about those any type of event, let's let's talk about some of those uh, events and that term event. Um, so we have all these events that are being logged on our phones, of course, which uh, are generators of lots of the events that Keen logs, for example. But there are also events coming from IoT, the Internet of Things stuff like sensors or devices or tractors or factories or cars, and you can store these as well. So what are the typical types of events that a user or a company wants to store? Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky question because every co- every company is different, and that's one of the sort of the key concepts behind Keen is that every company is different, and they're going to want to collect their own events and their own vocabulary. But we see some clustering for sure. So you definitely have your traditional uh, web analytics events. Page views um, are the primary driver there. On the mobile side, it tends to be session based. So um, you also have uh, UI interactions, whether those are you know clicks or touches or whatever they are. Um, on the IoT side, you know that's such a new world um, that we see you know a wide, wide variety of data coming in. You know the event model for or the data model for you know a company that's doing uh, a temperature sensor on the wall is very, very different from you know, John Deere's biggest tractors um, that or are heart completely rate self-driving or a heart rate monitor, right? Um, so, you know, we see some common things, you know, there are things like battery indications or battery life monitoring. There's, um, you know, connectivity monitoring and things like that. But the most valuable pieces of data tend to be very, you know, sub- specific to the domain uh, of the business in question. So let's talk about an example. So let's say I'm building my own podcast app for Software Engineering Daily, and I want an app experience where users can log in and they can listen to podcasts as an app. Like if I don't, if I didn't want to do that uh, through the iTunes Store or through sure. some some software or some some podcasting app, so. I, I can use this app to detect analytics on how people are using my Software Engineering Daily podcast app. How would I use that event data? And, and more specifically, how would I use Keen? Because I, I yeah. want to get to a discussion of, of Keen itself uh, and, and how we can use some of the, the, the APIs that, that you provide. Sure. So I think that's a, that's a great uh, discussion or a great uh, concept to dig into. So... <clears throat> at a high level, what you're describing is something that most companies these days need to do. If you're building uh, an offering for your customers, it's becoming more and more likely that you need to prove ROI to, their, to your customers. And the way you do that is by giving them analytics and, and the value they're receiving. Um, so we see this over and over again. Uh, our customers are coming to us to power you know, the analytics tab in their application or the analytics piece of their, uh, their mobile app. Um, so the way this works from a Keen perspective of how you integrate with Keen is uh, there's kind of three simple parts. The first part is what data do you want to collect? So we have SDKs um, for pretty much every language out there in, in every environment. So you download one of those SDKs and you integrate it into your app. And what you're doing there is deciding here are the here are the events that I want to record, and the events basically here are just JSON objects. Um, so here are the events I want to record, and here are the properties in those events that are important. So once you do your data modeling um, and you integrate with your app, your app is now sending data to our service. You know, Keen is a, a cloud service. We will store that data for you, and then that takes you to the second piece of the integration, which is what questions do you want to ask of that data? Basically, what um, queries are you going to write? And we have a simple uh, but powerful API for, for doing some really, um, you know, the, the, the most important concepts there are in, in analytics. Um, 
So, you know, that starts with things like basic counts and group buys and segmentation and goes all the way to really complex um, full like funnel analysis. Um, and then the third piece is once you've got the questions you want to answer, once you're, you're starting to get at that, the, the uh, aggregated data that's important to you, uh, then you start building visualizations because everybody wants to see these answers in the form of visualizations, not raw numbers. Um, and so we have SDKs that make it very easy to build nice charts and dashboards that are you know, uh, very simple to integrate into your application. Okay, so you've broken down the entire process of using Keen from a high level, and I want to get into the engineering topics that are involved in that workflow. Sure. So first, first of all, if if Keen is logging all of these events, like if I describe to Keen, I want all of these events, these different event types logged, like how a user is navigating my app and how a user is listening to podcasts and stuff. How does Keen manage all that event logging without affecting performance? So, uh, the basic primary driver here is recording data, especially at scale, should be done asynchronously. So you never want to be recording data uh, in a blocking fashion, um, especially not in, in like blocking the UI. That's a that's a big anti pattern. So our SDKs are built with that in mind, um, and we see you know we see our our most successful customers taking advantage of that. So when when you're logging all the events, do the events get sent one by one to Keen servers, or do you do they get batched on the device, for example, and then get sent in batches? So that's up to the customer. Uh, we have both single event and bulk event uh, endpoints for submitting data to us. Our uh, native SDKs for iOS and Android handle um, that batching for you, and then some of our other SDKs. Uh, simply allow you to choose. Okay, and so all these events are getting sent to Keen however I want, and then they get ingested on Keen's server. So then what happens? Do they get, do they get queued in Kafka, or what, what happens at, at the data ingestion layer? Yeah, so our application tier is written in Python on top of a framework called Tornado. Tornado is responsible for uh, doing you know the normal API things like authentication and authorization, and then uh, validation of, of the write request. And then once everything is good to go, then we're going to write that into Kafka, just as you said. So Kafka is definitely our um, queuing tier. So I'd love to know more about how you use Kafka. Like, how do you partition the event data for different users and different applications and just, just how you use Kafka in general. Yeah, I mean, so we're using Kafka in the most traditional way it's intended to be used, right? Uh, we're not doing anything particularly, um, I don't think we're doing anything particularly complicated or complex with it. We're just using it at a, at a high volume and I think using it well. So uh, in terms of partitioning, you know, every event, we're, we're very much a multi-tenant world here. So every event goes into a single topic and then the processes that um, consume the data are responsible for doing the the sort of per customer partitioning and making sure that when we persist data that there's a strong um, separation of concerns so that one customer can't see another customer's data. Okay, and so you deployed your own Kafka cluster, right? You didn't use like a, a managed provider. That's right. We um, we uh, built our own because when we started, partly because when we started there was nobody managing <laughs> <laughs> as an offering. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Is, is there, uh, so I guess it, today, if you started it, would you use some kind of managed provider, Confluent or something? It's a really interesting question. I think it depends very much on, certainly it depends on pricing and it also depends on the performance we would see. You know, at the end of the day, we are moving a lot of traffic um, into and out of Kafka because we use it for more than just the sort of core it, uh, event stream. We use it for uh, a number of things that happen after um, the event stream is created. And so having to pay network hops um, to go in and out of a DC for Kafka might might be a non-starter, but it's something I'd be interested in. In general, uh, we have come from a philosophy of let's let's buy as much as we can and not build it because there's there's already too much to build. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, we've we've had a lot of shows where we've discussed that build versus buy 
thing um, yeah. lately. It's, it's become such an interesting question because software, I mean, uh, not to speak in generalities, but software has gotten pretty good. And you can, you can buy a lot that's really good. <laughs> you can indeed, yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons we exist is because we believe that this this problem of building customizable analytics solutions is actually a pretty hard one. And most people don't want to have to deal with the, the intricacies. They shouldn't have to. They should they should get back to doing what they're what they started their companies to do, which is which is to build the software that solves the problems they're out they're out to solve. So you said you almost always tend to buy stuff. There must be some there must be some like trade off where you can eventually hit where you're like uh, it's not worth buying or, or or maybe not like are are the things that are worth buying do they typically just have cost structures that are all that always make it worth it to buy it and save time? Well, I mean, I think you always have to do that analysis of what are you buying and does it fit the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah, so, but there's so there's not like oppressive cost structures like uh, like I don't know maybe Oracle in the past or just these other things where like there used to just be this scarcity of choice and so there was. That these companies didn't offer good pricing, but now there's so much competition that they build in good pricing from the start. Yeah, I certainly think that we are in a world today where we can take advantage of the the pricing pressure on on software companies um, and infrastructure companies. It's certainly a, a that's certainly a, tr- a true thing about you know the state of modern software engineering in 2016. Um, but there's always you know there's always times where it makes more sense to build. <clears throat> sometimes it's you're forced into it because there isn't something you can buy that really fits uh, what you're trying to solve. And sometimes it's because, you know, the cost of integrating with whatever you're buying is actually higher than building yourself. If you know what you're, what you're buying is really simple. Of course. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, engineering, obviously. Um, so what about data storage? So you've, you know, you, you've ingested my events You've uh, got the Monte Kafka queue, and then what happens next? How do they get to the data storage layer? Yeah, so um, at a high level, like I said, Kafka is our uh, message queue, and then we have Storm, and Storm is responsible for doing the... uh, It consumes the Kafka queue and does all of the transformations and validation necessary to persist to our storage tier and our storage tier is, is Cassandra. Um, so, uh, we do a bunch of different things in storm, including, you know, partitioning, uh, events like we talked about before. So customers data is quite secure. And then, um, and then we also do some transformation to make sure that we're persisting data in a, in a columnar compressed format. Um, so we can, we can, analyze data a lot faster that way. Hmm. So what, what kinds of uh, transformations do you, do you have to do for that? So like, you, I guess you have a, an event that comes in as JSON. Explain what kind of transformation you might have to do to make that Cassandra friendly. Yeah, of course. So the first kind of transformation we do is one of our, uh, one of our features, which is we can augment your data for you. So, uh, for example, we can turn IP, your IP data into geodata or parse out your user agent for you to tell you what browsers um, your events are coming from. So that's one kind of transformation is basically just adding more information to the event, enriching the event. Um, but in terms of the core data model, uh, basically, you know, as you said, the incoming event is JSON. Um, if we store, and we tried this uh, as we were prototyping, if we stored just that raw JSON string, for example, per event, uh, A, our storage costs go up by a crazy amount, and B, analysis is really hard because in the read path, when you when you want to ask a question, then you have to pull out the full wide event, uh, JSON deserialize it, then pull out the property you care about, and then do that over and over again for the billions of events, which is just a non-starter. And so what we changed uh, to was... Essentially, in Cassandra, um, we group uh, events together. Um, so, call it about five thousand. That number is is actually it's very it's runtime determined, but it's usually around five thousand events. Um, we suck in those five thousand events and we transform them from JSON into essentially columns. So we say, what are the pro- what are the properties that exist in these five thousand events? Let's make uh, an array per property um, and say, okay, so 
event zero, its value for property A is this. Event one, its value for property A is this. Event two, its value for property A is this. We build that array, and then we um, compress it. And uh, first, we serialize it uh, with, uh, right now, we're using cryo, and then we compress it. And then that's what actually gets persisted to Cassandra. And so we, uh, we, can, we really uh, get a lot of cost savings that way for, for both you know, our storage costs as well as um, its customer facing, and that query has become a lot, lot faster. So uh, there's, I know there's some content around the internet uh, about this, but yeah. you used to be on Mongo, and uh, you migrated from Mongo to Cassandra. Uh, we don't need to go into this into detail because there's a blog post about it, but I, I'd love if you could explain how Mongo and Cassandra contrast for your use case at Keen, because I think there's a lot of people listening. We've had some Cassandra shows recently. People really like them, um, but they may still not completely understand the use cases of Cassandra. Mongo is pretty easy to understand. It's like a database that's great for storing JSON. Um, So how do Mongo and Cassandra contrast for your use cases? Yeah. Um, Happy to talk a little bit about that. So when we started the company, as entrepreneurs, we knew that the core risk to the business wasn't will our tech scale, it was, will anybody care about this? And Mongo allowed us to get started quickly with a proof of concept and, and show customers what we were talking about um, and get them excited. And then once we saw the business had legs, we knew, okay, now's the time we have to switch. And the reason we, have, we had to switch is Mongo is a great product, but at its core, it is not uh, horizontally scalable, right? It has a um, primary database that takes all the rights, you can have secondaries or replicas, as they call them, um, to help with the reads, but you can't um, you can't share write traffic, and so your write load is is limited by the size of your whatever your write uh, your uh, primary Mongo server is. Um, contrast that to Cassandra. You know, at at its core, it's a distributed system, um, meaning you have one to you know one to n nodes. The nodes all share responsibility for writing and reading different segments of data, and then you have replicas so that you can tolerate um, you can tolerate nodes going away, which does happen. Um, so, were you actually encountering locking problems with Mongo, and or were you able to avert that before the before those types of problems came up? No, I mean we were growing pretty fast. So we definitely ran into some issues. So, for example, uh-huh. we. We did a lot of our own monitoring, as you might expect. Uh, we're a pretty analytical company, and we had to actually turn some of those analytic streams off for our own internal use, simply because <laughs> the the right the right volume was too high. Um, That's so, never a good sign. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it is a in one sense, it's a great sign for the business, right? Because oh wow, we're actually we're growing quite quickly, but uh, certainly not a a great place to be as a technical team. It wasn't it wasn't fun. So what was the migration process from Mongo to Cassandra Hmm. like? Yeah, um, it was a fun one, you know. So once we had the system architected that involved Kafka, Storm, Cassandra, uh, and we were happy with it, we we did a couple things. And it was basically, okay, let's turn on, at, at, at the core it was pretty simple. It was let's turn on live writing to this new system. So we would write to, we would write to both systems. We'd write to Mongo and Cassandra. And then we kept track of when we did, when we, when we enabled um, Cassandra for customers and then did the process of backfilling. Um, so migrating historical data. And that was, you know, um, I think we used Kafka for that just to keep track of what um, what data there was or what you know which ones which which of our customers had been migrated which ones hadn't that kind of thing and we just you know we ran a bunch of processes to um, to essentially find data in Mongo and iterate over you know iterate through cursors and then put that into Kafka and then our new system could handle writing data so the bottleneck at that point was very very much Mongo you know. We, the new system was was writing data quite quickly and nicely, so it's just a matter of getting it out. Okay. Um, do you use your own Cassandra deployment, or do you use an enterprise version, enterprise software subscription? I'm not exactly sure how the how the uh, the Cassandra 
uh, managed yeah. ecosystem looks? So again, when we started this, there wasn't really much of a managed ecosystem. <laughs> okay. So we, we do run our own servers. Uh, the big, you know, there's a couple of big questions. There are, there are managed deployments these days um, that you can take advantage of. And then if you want to manage your own, which I think most Cassandra users do at this point, uh, the big question you decide between is do you use the open source version or data, uh, data stacks enterprise, I think is what they call it. Um, and right now we're on the uh, open source version. Um, the data stacks enterprise product is, I think, a, probably a pretty good product, but it, its main features are things around like Lucene and search indexing, which are uh, not things we do, so mm. not super valuable to us. Uh, they, do, they, they do have some good monitoring tools, but at this point we've invested really heavily and monitoring, so I think we get most of what we need um, already. Okay, so let's talk more about the users side. So, so if I want to, mm-hmm. if I'm a user, I want to process data across um, the the data that's stored on Keen. So, how do I run calculations across that stored data? Yeah, so we have, um, like I said, a simple API. It's a sort of a REST uh, REST based JSON API. Um, where the core primitives are things you, uh, if you're familiar with, with SQL, you'd be pretty uh, used to. So you say, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I want to do an analysis on this particular, what we call an event collection, um, which is analogous to a table. And then here's the kind of analysis I want to do, whether it's a count or a count unique, min, max, average, sum, percentile, um, uh, you know, we support all of those things uh, as first-class citizens. Um, you tell us what properties you want to analyze. So, you know, if you're doing um, a percent, you want a, the 95th percentile of a specific property. You tell us which property that is. Um, you give us time frames. So, time is a first-class citizen in our API. So, you tell us, you know, I want to analyze data from, you know, uh, we support both. Uh, like syntactic sugar keywords like yesterday or this three months or the last uh, four weeks. Um, or you can just give us, you know, timestamps and say, you know, I want to analyze a, I want to analyze data that starts at this particular point in time and ends at this particular point in time. Um, and then we also make it very easy to do things like partitionings or, or what we call group buys. So you can group by particular properties. Um, and you can also, uh, partitioned by time. So you can say, I want the last four weeks of data and I want daily data points. Um, and so all those things are, are just baked into this JSON API. Um, and uh, it's pretty easy to get going, for sure. So that API, or those API calls get translated into Storm requests on the back end. Is that correct? Yeah. So on the back end, Storm is responsible for orchestrating essentially what's a distributed MapReduce. And so that JSON query gets turned into all of the operations Storm has to do to you know, pull data out of Cassandra and then aggregate the data internally. Did, did you have to write your own query translator for that? Or do you use some kind of, is it, I don't know what options there are, but. Yeah, it's homegrown. Homegrown, okay. How was that to build? Like, was that complicated? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like uh, it. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's definitely, <clears throat> you know, the, the analysis engine is basically uh, where, where sort of the core of our IP lives. Um, you know, this is where we've spent a lot of our time and, and effort in... Uh, in making sure that we solve the problems of how do you ask questions of data at scale. <clears throat> and so uh, it's a little complicated, but but uh, I think it's actually pretty well, it's pretty well abstracted at this point. Like the, the architecture is pretty strong. Software engineers are always looking to automate their work. Software automation lets us get more done with the same number of resources. Investment automation works the same way. Wealthfront is an automated investment service that relies solely on software to acquire and manage client accounts. Traditional investment services have many humans in the loop, advising clients and taking fees. The problem with these older advisory services is that The advice that these services are applying is often so systematic that a computer could give the same answer, or an even better answer. Wealthfront takes a new approach with software-driven, automated investment, 
that provides better returns through software engineering. Go to wealthfront.com slash SE daily to get a special offer for our listeners. $15,000 managed for free when you open your account. Don't pay commissions and account fees. Maximize your gains with Wealthfront's Set It and Forget It investment automation. Check out wealthfront.com slash SE daily. It would support Software Engineering Daily, and it would also introduce you to the world of automated investments, so you can see if you like it or not. Wealthfront.com slash SE daily. Thanks to Wealthfront for sponsoring the show. You've been a, a loyal sponsor, and we really appreciate it. Now let's get on with the show. So when developers are using Keen and they want to do something with their event data, do, are they typically kicking off processing jobs in response to events happening and then having their applications update in real time with that newly processed event data? Or are they like, do they treat it as a backend that is, that is responding to events or are they processing like ETL kind of jobs that are uh, updating their applications on a much slower time horizon? Yeah. Great question. It's both. Um, <clears throat> So one of our core use cases is, is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, right? Native analytics, we are powering the analytics tab in a web app or the, the analytics component of a mobile application. Um, and that tends to be uh, cached views of, um, of the queries that a customer might care about. And we, we help with that caching. It's one of our features. Um, and that's that's more of like the real time. I want to see data as it comes in, and uh, I'm a user that's sort of interacting um, in real time with data. Uh, and then we also have you know folks who are doing ETL, whether that's um, you know these longer uh, you know longer pipeline like tasks, or um, or you know simply. Uh, collecting data in sort of a raw format and then doing some sort of augmentation uh, and then reinserting it back into reinserting it back into Keen. One of our one of our features is full um, full data export so you can get your data out in full fidelity and then and then do what you wish with it. Okay, so so Storm is interacting with Cassandra here. Are there any peculiarities about integrating Storm and Cassandra? Um I don't know if peculiarities is the word I would use, but there's certainly there's certainly things that you have to pay attention to, right? Um, and it really depends on your application model. So I'd say our write path is a very it's it's a more standard way to use Storm and Cassandra together, right? Storm reads off of Kafka, it does whatever work it needs to to decide how exactly it's going to persist data to Cassandra, and then it writes to to Cassandra. The and Cassandra is you know quite optimized for uh, writes uh, at scale. Um, I'd say our read path is where we had to be more thoughtful and, and uh, spent more time figuring out how do we scale this appropriately so that um, you know we're not uh, destroying Cassandra with too many reads at, at one time. Um, and yeah, so that, that's been, that's certainly been a, a learning process for us over the last, you know, we've been here, we've been around for four and a half years now. So, so we've covered this in some previous episodes, but can you explain why the read process is more intense for Cassandra and what the difficulties are? Yeah, I mean, at a high level, um, writing is writing. I think just essentially requires less uh, contention. So, uh, when a request comes into write. Um, Cassandra has an automatic partitioning scheme that says, you know, what you're what you're doing when you write in Cassandra, you're saying, I have this row key, I want to write, and then the columns inside this row key, um, and a row key part partitions specifically to um, a particular Cassandra node, or often multiple Cassandra nodes because you're running with a, a replication factor, um, uh, usually three, and then um, and then you just write. You write to Cassandra, and Cassandra has an interesting property of um, the driver itself controls. Uh, how do I say this? The driver controls the safety of the write. So you can say, I want to write it, you know, replication factor one, which is the 
most inexpensive but least safe option, and, or I want to write it replication factor all, which is the most safe but not at all tolerant to, um, to nodes going down. Um, and anyways, so when you write, you get to choose that, and the write path is, is relatively simple. It just goes and um, it just goes and persists the data. Um, and you know, there's that's a simplistic way of, of viewing what what Cassandra's uh, persistence strategy is. But essentially, that's what it, you know at, at the core. That's what it does, as opposed to the read path, which has to deal with a bunch of interesting corner cases from the write path. Um, so like one of the biggest examples that I'm, I, I bet you've talked about before is this concept of tombstones. So Cassandra doesn't actually delete data when you request to delete data. It instead inserts a tombstone. So a read um, for a bunch of data, including data that's been deleted, actually is doing more work than you'd expect because it's reading all of the historical data and then reading the tombstones and then doing um, a reconciliation process to say, okay, actually these rows or columns sometimes have been deleted, so I have to you know, blank these out before I return to the driver. Um, so tombstones in particular are pretty expensive. Um, and there are, you know, there are a number of other, <laughs> there are a number of other interesting corner cases, but that's that's probably the most uh, illustrative one I can I can. That's great. No, that's up. that's a really good explanation. Um, cool. And we actually had not covered tombstones. On oh, cool. Yeah, so tombstones are fascinating. Think. And then and then you have this concept of what Cassandra uh, folks will will call doomstones, which is a <laughs> uh, when your tombstone situation gets out of control. So. So. Actually, I think I think we talked about something similar to tombstones in an episode about Reoc. Yes, yeah. because Reoc was based on the Dynamo paper. I think Dynamo was had a big emphasis on on this some concept related to tombstones. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that sounds familiar to me. I mean, I'm I'm not a at all a Reoc user, so I don't want to speak right. specifically to it. But often, uh, when you have these kinds of you know. React, Cassandra, and I believe Dynamo are all based on this concept of the immutable data stores, where you've got files that, that represent your data. Those files are immutable. And to represent changes to that data, you, have, you essentially write new files and then do a reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. Cool. So let's talk about the broader software architecture a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if I'm developing a ser if I'm some developer, random developer at Keen, I'm developing some service I mean, do you have a, a microservices architecture, or is it more monolithic? What What's the broad architectural scheme? Yeah, you know, like any any good company that's been around for a while, um, it started more monolithic, and we're um, and we're now moving more towards microservices where it makes sense. So, uh, you know, we started with essentially back when we were on Mongo, we started with two services: the API and the website, um, and nowadays. There are a lot more. So um, we have obviously what we talked about already is the API. We talked about the website just now. Uh, we have our storm systems. Um, that is one code base, but there's a strong separation for the write path versus the read path. Um, then we have our um, query queuing service, which we uh, the service is responsible for accepting incoming requests query requests from the API and making sure Storm gets them appropriately and handles rate limiting and things like that. Um, you know, we have services that handle our um, uh, sort of customer metadata, um, so keeping track of what customers there are, um, helping with things like authorization and authentication. <clears throat> um, are these and, different uh, services containerized? Uh, we're just now getting into um, deploying oh. container. Uh, containerization. Yeah. T tell me about that conversation and that process. Yeah, I mean, so we built a pretty decent um, continuous delivery pipeline uh, before before Docker was ready. So we've got <clears throat> we've had some pretty strong infrastructure around that, um, and it was you know uh, depending on the deployment technology. So some some of our things are Python based, some of our things are uh, JVM based, um, but at the end of the day, you know, we had we had technology that would, that made it easy to to deploy these things. <clears throat> and now that we're um, now that we're spitting out more services, um, doing that kind of repeating that kind of infrastructure for every service is more expensive than we'd like 
And so, you know, it's one of, I think, the biggest reasons to move to, to containerization is, um, you know, build once, run anywhere. Uh, and, uh, and it makes it a lot easier for us in terms of deploying these services, and certainly it makes it easier for us in terms of ta uh, running and testing these services internally as a developer. You know, you don't want to have to, you don't have to suck in, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 different repos and try to build them all. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so are you, are you planning to use a container management service like Kubernetes? Um, we're still figuring out exactly how we want to deploy. So right now we've got some good experiments going um, with uh, Amazon's ECS, Elastic Container Service. Um, we are not using anything like Kubernetes right now. I'm, it's certainly possible that we go to a more simplified version of the world where um, at least for some services, you know, it's very easy to, to imagine just building AMIs that have the, doc, the Docker container locked in and then, and then just deploy AMIs and use that as the sort of <clears throat> atomic unit. Um, that'll work for some things and then for other things, you know, like we haven't even, we're not considering running Cassandra inside of a Docker container at all right now, for example. Are you entirely on AWS? No, we're <clears throat> a mix of... We're mostly in soft layer right now. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and uh, we have some things in AWS for sure. So if you go with ECS, is that uh, could that be kind of an impetus to move more, even more to AWS or entirely to AWS? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, I don't. <clears throat> we're not committing to anything today, obviously, but. Uh, I think there are a number of things we're doing that make sense to be in AWS, um, and so we're you know we're always we're continuously um, monitoring the, the situation there. And, is there a way to make that work otherwise? To use ECS to deploy your containers to soft layer servers? No. No. Okay. If we use ECS, uh, the the things that are running inside of ECS will be in AWS for sure. Oh, okay. So probably. So I guess the, is the, is the majority of your uh, your computer, your services, I guess, is that like is the Cassandra, like Cassandra being on SoftLayer? Or certainly, our, our biggest uh, investments are in the the core data pipeline, Kafka Storm and Cassandra, and that's all okay. SoftLayer today. Ah, uh, okay. And so, so that stuff, and you're not even considering moving that stuff into containers right now. So maybe you want to build up uh, expertise in containers by moving more. Uh, lighter weight services yeah. uh, into those containers, and then if you get comfortable with it, or you you know you see the prospects for that working well with Cassandra or Kafka or whatever else, then you can containerize that stuff. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it, the the model for stateless services um, being containerized is really, I think, pretty well understood at this point, um, and there's a lot of value there. Uh, I think our organization needs to do like exactly like you said. Uh, we need to investigate more what the process is for containerizing uh, stateful services. Right. Yeah. I, I, I've I've heard ruminations about this uh, stateful versus stateless containers on the show, but this mm -hmm. that explanation really brings it home. Um, Good. Yeah, that's useful. So, so what is the I mean, as you're kind of in flight and, and you're like considering this container movement process, uh, how is your deployment, your build and deployment system evolving since things are changing at the same time? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's, um, <laughs> uh, I guess the short answer is it's evolving quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> quickly. <you know. laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely a place that... Um, that we try to invest in is it's often hard to invest because it's obviously not immediately customer impacting. Um, and we're, you know, we're here to, to deliver value to customers, but, mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, it's one of the core force multipliers for our engineering team. So we want to make sure that, um, that we're investing into it appropriately. And, and, um, you know, the biggest, I think the biggest investments over the last call it year, year and a half have been in getting, uh, out more outside of our, our, you know, our internal Jenkins environment and into, um, frankly, better tools like, uh, you know, we're, we're heavy users of Circle CI, for example. Um, and that allows us to, that allows us to, to move a lot faster and make sure that 
these services that we're now starting to expose all have um, sort of well understood um, CD uh, mechanisms. Um, but you know, as we move, you know, as we move more and more things into AWS, there's that's going to continue to to have impacts on on uh, our deployment processes. So explain that in a little more detail. So Jenkins versus Circle CI, for example, how does the continuous deployment experience uh, contrast between using those two software tools? Yeah, I mean, uh, at you know, Jenkins is is what we started with, and it's a really useful piece of technology and software that uh, that allows us. Uh, what we essentially used it for was okay when it detects um, new changes to Git. Um, it's going to kick off tests, right? That's that's the core of what it does. It also um, runs our deployment process. So when we we have our um, we have our deployments, they go through Slack actually. So we built a bot that um, parses Slack commands and then pushes API requests to Jenkins, and Jenkins then kicks off uh, the code responsible for deploying to our various services. Um, and that's really good, and we we still use that. Um, it's been, I think, what Circle CI and tools like it bring to the table is essentially like they they are they're building Jenkins but better, and they're actually investing into it every day as opposed to us, where you know we're still using the same a similar Jenkins install to what I built four years ago, um, and so you know it becomes a lot easier to stand up different services or dependencies that your services. Uh, care about whether that's you know for example um, some of our tests require Cassandra to be up um, it's kind of a pain to to start Cassandra and get everything going circle makes that nice and easy on Jenkins we'd have to you know write a bunch of shell scripts to, to bootstrap that um, and so these are the these are the kinds of things that circle makes easier and there's just a lot of you know there's a lot of design niceties that are you know by themselves like one by one not that big a deal but taken in concert are actually pretty important Certainly. So I can I can think that when you're considering these core infrastructure changes, like uh, moving your testing infrastructure or, or you know A/B testing testing infrastructure between Jenkins and Circle CI, or uh, doing this ECS experimentation stuff, monitoring becomes really important mm-hmm. because because uh, when when you're when everything is in flight uh, and and you you can't have a test infrastructure for testing the test infrastructure or testing your deployment infrastructure that you're completely revamping. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the testing infrastructure to build for running that kind of test would be so complex and burdensome. So monitoring tools are probably a, uh, a good um, complement, or, or it's, I mean, it's just what you need. Tell me about the monitoring process that you have in place. Yeah. I mean, that stuff is critical, especially for us where we're running a, 24/7 service that uh, our customers, you know, depend on um, to make decisions in their business. So, um, monitoring is really important. Uh, we do a couple different kinds. Certainly, we're one of our biggest users. Uh, we think we built a good product and we take advantage of it. Um, and so, we use that for for many areas of the business, uh, including you know some some core things like keeping track of how, you know. How much data are people sending us? What are the kinds of queries people are sending us? How much? How many queries are they sending us? How much data are we processing? <clears throat> All these things. Um, but we don't want to be in the situation where, if we experience um, any service interruption, that we can't figure out what's going on because we're instrumented with ourselves. So we're heavy users of. Um, Datadog and all of our services send data send Datadog metrics uh, through StatsD, <clears throat> and that's sort of our one stop shop for uh, you know our, our ops teams uh, making sure that um, that Keen is up and healthy. And you have a dedicated ops team? Um, no, no, we have our engineering team is broken down into a couple major teams and then individuals from those teams. Um, make up what our, you know, essentially our on-call rotation is. Um, And our on-call rotation is sort of uh, a virtual ops team, you might call it. And then, and then, you know, uh, part of... The rolling ops team. Yeah, exactly. And part of writing software at Keen is um, certainly knowing 
how what you're going to deploy will affect um, production and, and the ops team in general. Um, so you know everybody everybody plays their part in making sure that uh, uh, things are instrumented correctly and that we have visibility into the things that matter. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk some about the business. Um, the the analytics business it seems like such a good business to be in to me because. The costs are going down and down and down for the resources like compute and storage, but as a, a proprietary piece of software, you get to set the market for the nice proprietary layer that sits on top of that compute and storage, and you get to capture the ever-increasing cost differential between the cost of your proprietary layer and the decreasing cost of the storage layer. Is that an accurate description of the business? I think um, many, much of that is true. Um, there are some <clears throat> there are some really nice things about uh, the economics of being in analytics. That being said, you know our job is to provide and our our job is to show the value to our customers. So, and hopefully part of that is being able to degre decrease costs when it makes sense because our underlying costs are going down. Uh, the reason we're in this business and the reason we like analytics is because it's so big. Uh, at the core of it, analytics is essentially science and, you know, I think we can all agree that science is a valuable thing. Uh, <laughs> and so, not a winner-take-all market. And absolutely not a winner-take-all market. <laughs> um, so it is, you know, that's one of the tricky things about being in analytics is that it, there are so many analytics companies. It's one of the reasons we've chosen the path we have is instead of, you know, we're not, a, we're not a, an analytics tool like uh, Google Analytics or Mixpanel or Kissmetrics. Um, we're an analytics platform, and to us, what that means is you get much of the customization and flexibility of having of of, of building analytics infrastructure yourself, but you just don't have to do any of it. You don't have to pay the cost, um, and that uh, that is something that I think resonates really well with our customers. What are the areas of your operating expenses that are going down the most quickly? Um, I think the biggest areas for us right now are due to uh, investments we've made in in uh, software. So ah. basically, we're just getting more and more efficient at doing the same kinds of things. Um, right. One key area for us is Storm. For example, you know we have a big Storm cluster, and uh, that's a place where we can where we have been and continue to do. Uh, a number of optimizations where we can decommission servers um, as we make good advance advancements there. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, are, are customers storing an increasing amount of data every year? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> we get better at storing data, but our costs there go up just because there's more data to store. Mm. So w at what pace do customers expect lower prices? Because... It seems like the the market, like the compute and storage market, would would drop before customers would kind of uh, have an impression of that drop. So, so it seems like you can always be, in some sense, ahead of the the customer expectations of price. Uh, but then, you know, you're competing with other analytics platforms on that price differential. So. What is I, I mean? What is the, th the thinking around that? Around like staying competitive with the price, but also you know you want to you want to capture the margin on that decreasing yeah. uh, cost that you get. Yeah, obviously we pay attention to our margin, but frankly, the the when we're talking to our customers or or potential customers, our job is to attempt to describe the value that you can get by using Keen. And the value is often really not attached to the underlying uh, cost of the infrastructure. It's instead um, attached to what the business outcomes will be. So oftentimes, you know, we're um, we're revenue generating for our customers because people, our customers, are selling analytics as part of their offering. So that's one clear place where we can just we just talk about value there. Um, another way that we we think about it is how much time are we saving you in terms of engineering. 
uh, effort. So you know, if we can save you, uh, I think it's really conservative to say that we save you know we save our customers probably two or three engineers for a year. You think about what you're going to pay two or three engineers for a year who can build this kind of you know big data analytics system um, to use uh, buzzwords. Um, <laughs> You know, I think the the value proposition is is pretty obvious, um, and so we spend a lot more of our time in deal making talking about value proposition as opposed to what does it cost us to to serve this. So, what's the switching cost for a customer who wants to move between different analytics services? Like, if they want to move from another service to Keen or from Keen to another service, is that switching cost as high as something like I don't, I don't know how high is that switching cost? Well, it's a tricky question. So there are a couple of variables. The, um, probably the most important one is how much data there is, right? So um, you know, for, for like a Facebook, it's nigh on impossible. Um, there's just too much data. Um, but for most, for most companies, it's possible. We, make it, uh, we have tools um, to migrate data into Keen from external systems so we try to make that easy you know we want to we want to minimize the pain there um, the other big variable is integration points or essentially how are you using the data um, and so for most analytics tools it's not that bad because your integration point is well I log into this dashboard that they give me and if you no longer care about that dashboard then well you're not losing anything um, for other for other places where you're actually integrating with uh, your analytics, or it's like built into your data pipeline, then it becomes a little bit trickier, um, and that's that's something we see sometimes, but often oftentimes it's really not that big a deal. Um, people are the co- the switching cost isn't too bad. Oh. So what's what's in the future for Keen? How is your business evolving, and how your how's your customer base evolving? What kinds of uh, things are you focused on building right now? Yeah, so we are at a high level really excited about um, a few a few really strong customer concentrations we're seeing. So I've talked about native analytics. Um, just to reiterate, you know the way that. Uh, we can easily power our customers' analytics uh, applications. Uh, That that feels like a pretty unique place to be in the market. Um, As far as we can tell, we don't really have real competition there aside from um, teams who want to build things themselves. And so that's an area we're investing really heavily in. We're investing really heavily in um, some of the more customizable segments of the market, whether that's... um, IoT, like we talked about, you know, we think there's a huge upside there as time goes on. You know, VR is just getting started, but I imagine there's going to be a whole world there. Um, you know, uh, uh, even frankly, like we're seeing a number of our uh, customers concentrated around uh, just doing in-depth web analytics that they can't do with the existing products out there. Um, so, focusing in on the areas of you know areas where customers really want to build custom um, analytics solutions. That, that's, a, that's a strong growth lever for us. And, and um, put another way, or maybe a little bit more abstractly, what we've done for the first, you know, call it three and a half, four years of the business was build, um, you know, build Legos, right? We made it really easy to uh, take these Legos and you could sort of put them together in any way you wanted. Um, but sometimes customers just want to buy a Lego set. They want to build their castle. They want to build their spaceship. Um, and so that's a big thing that we're focusing on is how do we give um, specific solutions to the customers that need them. Cool. Well, that sounds like a great place to stop. Dan, I want to thank you for coming on the show. This has been a really fascinating conversation. I'm glad to hear it. It was great for me. Thanks for having me. <laughs>